My name is Rick Renner, and I'm in the upper room in Jerusalem. This is the traditional site where Jesus regularly rendezvoused with his apostles when they were in Jerusalem. Now, when you look at this today, what you see today is the work of crusaders. But much, much earlier than that, as early as the fourth century, this was identified as the room where Jesus met with his apostles when they were in Jerusalem. And so many events took place in this room. We saw that in John chapter 13, it was here that Jesus washed the apostles' feet. He served communion. In John 14, 15, and 16, it was here that he taught about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In John 17, Jesus prayed his high priestly prayer. And after the resurrection, the Bible says in John chapter 20, the disciples were meeting behind doors for fear of the Jews when Jesus came and stood in the midst of them. And Jesus said to them, peace be unto you. And he breathed on them and told them to receive the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit. And that's really the very moment when they were born again. That happened in this very space. Again, it doesn't look like it looked at that time, but nonetheless, this is the place where that took place. What amazing things happen when we yield our home to Jesus. This was someone's home. This was someone's upper room, and we even know who. It belonged to Mary, who was the mother of John Mark and the sister of Barnabas. She surrendered her home for the use of Jesus, and Jesus filled her home regularly, which is what Jesus will do with your home and your family if you'll surrender it to him. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about events in the upper room and what happens when you yield your life to Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Welcome to today's program. As I told you in the introduction today, I'm going to talk to you about upper room realities. I showed you yesterday that Jesus wants to invade your home. Now, just look at your house. Look at your living room or your kitchen, or even look inside your car, wherever you are. Jesus wants to take up that space, invade it, and occupy it with his power, with his glory, his presence, his gifts. Jesus is just waiting for you to throw open the door. Many years ago, when Denise and I first got married, we said, Lord, you can have our lives. You can have our home. It all belongs to you. And we threw open the door. And my friends, Jesus occupied our life and he's occupied our home all of these years. Jesus wants to occupy your space. That's why I'm teaching this series called Upper Room Realities. You can have an upper room reality right in your own space. That is the will of God. He's just waiting for you to throw open the door. That's why I want you to get my series called upper room realities. I have never heard anybody teach anything like this, but God put it on my heart to study all the events that occurred in one room in the New Testament. And I was stunned to find there are more than 260 verses that describe miraculous events that all occurred in the same person's living room over and over and over and over because she open the door to Jesus. And that's what will happen if you will open the door to Jesus. Anyway, order this, Upper Room Realities. It's five parts, it comes in multiple formats, and it comes with a study guide. If you heard yesterday's program, it was just loaded with information. All that information is in this study guide. Right now, we're also offering you two books. One is called why We Need the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. The other is called The Holy Spirit in You. The subtitle says, Working Together as Heaven's Dynamic Duo. And the reason I'm offering these two books with this series is because Jesus wants his power to occupy your private space. He wants you to know how to partner with the Holy Spirit. That's why I want you to have this book called The Holy Spirit and You. He wants you to know how to move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's why I want you to have this book called Why We Need the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. The two of these together will help you to open the door for the power of God to begin to operate in your life. And for those who become partners, we always send a package of books as our way of saying welcome to the partner family. The two books are Life in the Combat Zone and Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness. 
We're so grateful when you become a partner because you're literally helping us take the water of God's Word to people that are famished for the Word of Truth. Everyone does not have what you have. And when you become a partner, you enable us to take the teaching of the Bible to people that are crying out for it. And I want to say thank you for being a partner with our ministry. And if you need prayer, always remember that we're here for you. We want to pray with you. Call us or send us an email. The moment we hear from you, we're going to put our faith together with you. But today we're returning to our series called Upper Room Realities. I have my Bible. I hope that you have yours. We always use the Bible in this program. And today we're going to be seeing a lot in Acts chapter 1. When you come to the book of Acts, you find that a lot of events happened in one person's living room. That room today is called the Cenacle. You can still visit it in the city of Jerusalem. It really is the room where all of these events took place. And we know from Scripture, as we saw yesterday, this was a house that belonged to a woman named Mary. She was a very wealthy woman. It seems that she was a widow. She had a brother whose name was Barnabas. Barnabas eventually became one of the apostles. And she had a son whose name was John Mark, the same John Mark who later became Peter's secretary and who wrote the book of Mark as Peter dictated it. But all of the events that we read about in one living room in the book of Acts it all occurred in her house. Now, why did it happen in her house? Because she opened the door. She said, Jesus, if you want to use my house, you can have my house. But today we're going to see what happened in that living room in Acts chapter 1. So let's go to Acts chapter 1. And today we're going to begin in verse 4. And when you come to Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Jesus is giving commandments to his apostles that they should go to the city of Jerusalem. Listen to what he says. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Verse 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Jesus was prophesying the coming of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And verse 12 says, then returned they unto Jerusalem. Well, where did they go? Well, the Bible tells us. Look again at verse 12. Then returned they into Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey, verse 13. And when they were come in, they went into an upper room where abode Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon and Judas, the brother of James. There was a lot of people gathered together in this upper room. Eventually, 120 people gathered together in this large upper room, which belonged to a woman named Mary who lived very near the temple in the central part of Jerusalem. But the Bible calls it an upper room. This word upper room is a Greek word, hooperoan. This word hooperoan describes the highest part of a house. The upper rooms are the upper story of a house a large room in the upper part of the house, an upper chamber, and usually it was the largest open space in ancient, very large homes. And that's what this was. Now we see another example of this in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 20, verses 7 and 8, where the Bible also speaks of an upper chamber or an upper room. So let's look at it just to see another example. And when you come to Acts chapter 20, verse 7 and 8, the Bible says... And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples were come together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continue his speech until midnight, which Paul preached a long time. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were all gathered together. That word upper chamber is the same Greek word, hooperoan, a large upper chamber, the upper floor of a house. Well, now when you come to Acts chapter 1, that is what you find when the Bible describes the upper room. And today, if you visit the city of Jerusalem, you can go to an ancient room called the Cenacle. It really is this very same room, which was last redecorated in the 14th century. So it looks today like it looked nearly 800 years ago. But it is the upper room, a large upper room of a large house which was in the city of Jerusalem. And verse 13 says, 
all the disciples came into the upper room and they abode there. That word abode is a Greek word, katameno. It means they continued there consistently. They abided there. That's what the King James Version says. And when you come to verse 14, it says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. But notice in verse 14, it says, these all continued. The word all is the Greek word pantes. It means all, all of them. It is an all-encompassing word, which means no one was excluded. Everyone in the room continued with one accord. Even the word continued here is so very important. It is a Greek word pros kartereo. This word pros kartereo doesn't just mean to continue. It means to continue steadfastly. They were nearly addicted to what they were doing. That's really what the Greek word means. It means to preserve consistently. It pictures intense focus, very hard work, constant diligence, effort that never lets up. It pictures one who's fixed in a forward position. He's leaning forward to obtain something. He's not willing to give up until he has gotten it. So when the disciples gathered into this room, they didn't just sit around easily in the room and wonder what was going to happen. They literally began to press into the spirit in prayer. They were pressing forward. They were very diligently steadfasting, almost like they were addicted. We're not going to stop until we get what Jesus has promised us. And my friends, I'm going to tell you, if you want Jesus to give you what you're believing for, you've got to press in for it. That's what we now find in verse 14. But wait, it goes on to say they continued with one accord. This word one accord tells us there was a lot of spontaneity to what was happening in that room. For example, it is the Greek word homo thumadon. The word homo really describes something that happens in one moment or something that happens simultaneously. The word thumas, the second part of the word, depicts passions. When you compound the two words together, it pictures those that are stirred up, excited, and in one moment, they're caught in an eruption of passion or a thrilling moment. They had highs while they were praying. They had peaks in their times of prayer. And sometimes when you're in an intense season of prayer, you have low moments and suddenly you'll have a peak of prayer. That is what we find happening now in the upper room. A lot of drama. A lot of events are unfolding as the disciples have gathered in Mary's living room. This is really somebody's living room. And all of them, the Greek word pantes, all, all of them, not one of them ex accepted. All of them continued. They were all pressing in, steadfast, working hard, really focused on receiving what Jesus had promised. They had high moments of euphoria and eruption of passion as they were praying. And the Bible says they continued in prayer. Even the word prayer is so very important. It is a form of the Greek word pros UK. Now listen very careful to the meaning of this word prayer, pros UK. Actually here in this verse, it's translated prayer and supplication. The word supplication does not appear in the Greek. It's just the word prayer, but it kind of conveys the idea of supplication. That's why the interpreters interpreted as prayer and supplication. But listen to what it means. It's a form of the Greek word pros UK. This word pros UK describes close, upfront, intimate contact. This lets us know in that upper room, in that living room, they got up close with God. They were really pressing in. It means to come close in order to express a wish, a desire, or even to make a vow. It was originally used to describe a person who vowed to give something to God in exchange for something that he wanted. And it really portrays the idea of surrender. God, I'll give you everything if you'll give me what I want. So in that upper room, they weren't just lightly praying. They were literally coming as close to God as they could. The Greek word plus UK. In the presence of God, in this intimate position, they were saying, God, we surrender all. That's what the word prayer here means. That's why it's also translated prayer and supplication. They were literally saying, God, we give you all if you'll give us your all. We're willing to make an exchange. We're here to make an exchange with you. So in this word prayer is the concept of surrender. They were surrendering 
to the will of God in that upper room. Look at the intensity and the passion happening in that upper room. And it goes on to say, they continued in prayer and supplication with the women. And I think this is so profoundly important because the word with in Greek is the word soon, which carries the idea of partnership. Women were involved right from the very outset of the church. God saw no difference between men and women. He was going to pour his spirit out upon both. And the women are there. And the word soon here translated with means they were really partners in what was taking place there. And not only were women there, but the Bible says, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, which means Jesus' own mother was in that room. And when the Holy Spirit was finally poured out in Acts chapter 2, and everyone was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, Mary spoke in tongues, which means Mary was one of the original Pentecostals. But wait, what else does it say? It says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. The word brethren is plural. It is referring to Jesus' natural brothers. Jesus had multiple brothers. They are all in the upper room. By this time, Jesus has already appeared to James. James has been converted. James is even in the upper room. And when the Bible says with his brethren, the word with is again a translation of the Greek word soon, which means these brothers were already partners with what was taking place in that room. God wants your brothers and sisters, your siblings to be partners in the ministry. He's calling them. All of these amazing events were taking place in Mary's, Mary's living room. This was really her living room. It was her upper chamber. Then when you come to verse 15, the Bible tells us what happens next. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number, of the number of names together were about 120. So it's about 120 people in that upper room. Verse 16, men and brethren, this scripture, scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which by the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. The word guide, by the way, is the Greek word hodegas. It describes one who knows all the paths, all the trails, all the roads, Judas was really familiar with Jesus and where Jesus went and where Jesus regularly went to pray. And that's why he was able to lead the soldiers there to take Jesus. But then when you come to verse 17, it says, for he was numbered with us. That word numbered is very important. It's from the word arithmetic. He was literally counted with us. If you add up all of us, he was really among us. In fact, it says he was numbered with us. In Greek, it means he was literally in us or he was among us. He was one of us and had obtained part of this ministry. The word obtained, the Greek word lakano. The word lakano means to receive something by divine allotment. So though Judas spoiled the opportunity, he had really been called divinely by God to be in the ministry. And even the word ministry here is so very important. It is a Greek word diakonia. The word diakonia is a form of the Greek word diakonos. And listen to what the word ministry means. This is important because it tells us what the disciples believed about them and their ministry. Listen to what this word ministry really means. It's from the Greek word diakonos, which pictures a high level servant, one that is sophisticated and highly trained servants who serve the needs of others. So the very first thing this tells us is the disciples were taught by Jesus. This was high level professional servanthood. They were trained to be the very best they could be as they served the needs of others. And by the way, if you're in the ministry, you need to be the very best you can be at everything you do because you're representing Jesus. This is his ministry. It described a servant whose primary responsibility was to serve food and to wait on tables. Well, if you're in the ministry, that's what we do. We serve the word of God. We serve spiritual food. It described a waiter or a waitress who painstakingly attended to the needs, wishes, and desires of his clients. Servants who professionally pleased clients. It was a type of serving that was honorable, pleasurable, and done in a fashion that made the people being served feel as if they were nobility and here it is used to describe anyone that is in the ministry. My friends, we're in the ministry. And we're in the ministry. We're to be the very best we can be. We're to be professional at the way that we serve others. And the very fact 
that they use this word diakonia in this verse tells us from the very outset they understood they were not to do anything that was shabby or second class. Jesus had called them into the ministry. This was high level servanthood. Wow. But then when you come to Acts chapter 1, verse 21, it continues to say, Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, verse 22, beginning from the baptism of John, unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. The word witness is even important. The word witness is the Greek word martus. It's where we get the word for a martyr, and this is very important. It describes one that is summoned to testify in a court of law, a real legal witness. He doesn't have secondhand information. He has firsthand information. The evidence presented in a legal case. The legal witness was allowed to only speak what he personally knew to be true. And because others may not appreciate his witness... He had to be ready to deal with retribution of others who didn't appreciate what he said. This meant to be a witness, you had to be a person of integrity. You had to be a person willing to take the brunt of those that do not like you. You had to be willing to really stand for the truth and only speak firsthand information. And now as Peter addresses the crowd in the upper room, now I want you to imagine, friends, this is really happening in somebody's living room. They're sitting around in the living room together in the upper room. And Peter says, hey, guys, we need to choose a new apostle. He's looking at the 120. He says, we need to choose somebody that's been with us from the very beginning, has been a witness of the resurrection of Jesus, a firsthand witness. They don't have secondhand information. They can say they know it personally themselves. And the Bible says in chapter 1, verse 23, and they appointed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. Now, this is amazing to me what happens next in verse 24. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two men thou hast chosen. But I just have to say something about the words, thou knowest the hearts. Knowest the hearts in Greek is the word cardio guneskes. The word cardio is the word for the heart. The word guneskes means to know. When you compound the two words together, it would little be translated the heart knower or the one who is an expert at all hearts. And that's who Jesus is. And they said, Lord, we're talking to you. In fact, when you read this in the Greek, it's very direct. In Greek, it says, su kurie. They're getting right up front with him. They're pressing into his presence, speaking to him directly. Su. You can't be any more direct than that. The word kuria, it's very directly, you, Lord. They're calling out to him. You, the heart knower, the expert of all hearts, show us which one of these men that you have chosen. The word chosen from the Greek word eklego, it really means to say out. Which of these men have you called? Which of them have you spoken their name and you've already extended a call to them? Confirm it to us. And the Bible tells us an amazing thing took place in Verse 26, and they gave forth their lots. That means they cast the dice. (laughs) They weren't filled with the Holy Spirit yet. When you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, the best you can do is just cast the dice and hope you get a right answer. The good news is God helped them in that event. They cast the dice and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. All of that occurred in this upper room while they were waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. All of that drama, prayer, intense prayer, spontaneous moments of eruptive prayer, pressing into the presence of God, surrendering themselves to God, choosing a new apostle. My friends, sometimes we make all this real textbook, but it was really happening in somebody's living room She, Mary, opened her house to Jesus, and Jesus took it. He took it. And if you'll open your house to Jesus, amazing events will happen in your house too. I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. How would you like for your living room to have a visitation of God's power? In the book of Acts, we find that many supernatural events occurred in the living room of one family over and over again. Pentecost is waiting to happen again. 
but this time it can happen right in your own living room. In the five-part series, Upper Room Realities, you'll learn how to prepare your house for an eruption of God's power, how to make sure a divine visitation happens at your address. Available in digital or physical format starting at just $10, this series will help you make way for God's power to erupt right inside your house. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase the books The Holy Spirit in You and Why We Need the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. In these two books, Rick will bring you to an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit and show you how to operate in spiritual gifts. You can know the Holy Spirit intimately and become a partner with Him in spiritual gifts, but you need to know how to do it. And this is what you'll discover in these two powerful books. Order your copy today, The Holy Spirit in You, for just $15 and why we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit for only $10. Don't miss this special offer. Upper Room Realities and the books The Holy Spirit in You and Why We Need the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. My friend, we're just getting started in this teaching. Tomorrow we're going to come back and we're going to see what happened in the very same upper room in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. I can hardly wait for tomorrow's program. But I'm offering you my series called Upper Room Realities. Jesus wants your house to be a place where upper room realities take place. Wow. And it comes with a marvelous study guide that's filled with all the scriptures, everything that I'm teaching so quickly in these programs. It's all in the study guide. And we're also offering you two books right now, Why We Need the Gifts of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit and you working together as heaven's dynamic duo. My friends, you need to know how to partner with the Holy Spirit so you can experience the upper room in your personal life right in your own house. Jesus wants to move in your home. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that you want to work in our lives. And Father, we today ask you, come in, Jesus. Lord, we open the door. Holy Spirit, come with all your power. Come with your glory. Come with your gifts. Erupt in our midst. Occupy our space and our lives. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Wow, it's been so good. I'll see you tomorrow. And until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity.